so welcome again everyone uh, today we are meeting here on webex to talk about hydrate suppression and how we can use promax to help assimilate the processes involved in this uh, my name is katrina heinova and i'm with brian research and engineering uh, i'm actually located in our office in europe uh, so i'm currently talking to you from brno uh, czech republic and today we are going to talk about hydrate uh, suppression before we start a little bit about us bre uh, so brian research and engineering we are the developers and providers of assimilation software promax and here in this picture you can see most of our team uh, we are located in three offices around the world uh, so we do have office here in czech republic then we do have our main office in um, us and we also do have office in singapore in asia and all of us we are organizing these webinars uh, we do have webinars which are hosted in the european times uh, but also our office in us and uh, asia and singapore they're organizing very nice webinars so you're you're definitely i want to encourage you to attend those as well what we are here for, uh, we are here to assist you. We wanna make sure that uh, you succeed in your job and we would be happy to help you solve your um, challenges using our services and using Promax as, as the tool. Today, we are going to talk about hydrates. Uh, we will define what are hydrates and we will talk about how we can inhibit their formation using methanol and also how we can remove water from our gas uh, using TEG, the hydration unit. So that's what we are, that's what I'm going to be showing you. So what are actually hydrates? Um, hydrates are hydrocarbons surrounded by water molecules, and they form this uh, cleft rate, as you can see on the picture. Uh, they are solids, and they're actually relatively stable solids. And as you can see in the two pictures at the bottom, what they will do, they will slow down and block the fluid flow through your pipelines. And that's definitely something you do not want. So uh, we need to make sure that we prevent their formation. How do we do that? Um, there are three ways how to achieve that. Uh, first one, we just have to make sure that we are going to operate at temperatures and pressures, which will not result in the hydrate formation. Usually, if we make sure that we operate at high enough temperatures, uh, we'll make sure that the hydrates will not form. But that's not always possible. You do have processes uh, where you actually operate at low temperatures and you need to do that. So then other two options come into play. First is you are going to inject an inhibitor which uh, could be methanol or MAC, and that's going to prevent the surrounding of the hydrocarbon molecule by water. Uh, the third option is to remove water because, I mean, water is really needed for the hydrocar uh, hydrate formation. So if you remove water to a certain level, you will be able to go to lower temperatures. So today we're going to talk about two main processes which are involved in hydrate suppression. The first one is going to be the inhibition. So what we do is we are going to inject an inhibitor and what the inhibitor will achieve, it's going to shift the hydrate formation curve to the left. So what you're currently looking at, this is a face envelope. This is actually a figure which was generated using Promax. And while 
The blue and red line, they're really the face envelopes. Uh, the green and black line are showing hydrate curves at different levels of methanol injection. So you can see that when we inject a small amount of methanol, we are able to shift the hydrate curve. Let's imagine we have not injected any methanol and we are currently operating at 40 degrees Celsius and 20 bars. Do we have a problem? Do we potentially form hydrates? I'm getting a lot of no's and that's correct. So at this point, we don't have any problems. However, what happens once we start to cool down the stream and we are going to go to minus 20? degrees. So we have not injected any methanol. We are at minus 20 degrees and 20 bar. Could we form hydrates at that point? Getting some yeses and that's correct. So if we don't inject methanol and we're here, we would form hydrates. However, if we inject a small amount of methanol, you see the curve is on the left side and we are safe. Uh, the two most common inhibitors uh, would be methanol and glycol. The second option is to remove water, so to do dehydration. And again, you can see the face envelope here. And again, what we do is we are shifting a curve from the black one where we had more water present in the stream and when we removed water to lower level, we were again able to shift the curve. Uh, the most commonly used glycols for dehydration would be diethylene glycol and triethylene glycol, so DEG and TEG. And today we will focus on TEG unit. The dehydration process itself, it's a physical absorption, so we will get to discuss um, this process and how to model it in products. At this point, I'm going to go into a Promax file. So I have opened a Promax file where we are going to demonstrate how to simulate and optimize methanol injection. So what do you see uh, at this flow sheet? It's a saturated gas, uh, which is at 38 degrees Celsius, and we are cooling down the gas to minus 10 degrees Celsius. Let's have a look at the warnings tab. So warnings tab will always give you a summary of all the warnings which are present in the simulation. And as you can see here, I'm getting a warning that the stream two, so that's the stream at 10 degrees Celsius, is below ice formation and is below hydrate formation. So Promax is automatically warning me that I could form hydrates and ice, so solids, in this uh, stream. If I want to know exactly what those temperatures are, I can go to the stream two and I could go to analysis and I could add an analysis, which is called freeze out hydrate and water viewpoint. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to solve it. And you can see here that the solids formation temperature is actually 18 degrees Celsius. While we're operating the stream at minus 10. So we are way below the hydrate formation. And if you want to see what is the ice formation temperature, uh, you can have a look over here. We can also add a face envelope analysis. So there is an analysis which is called face envelope. And if I solve it and I look at the plots, I'm really just going to get the face 
envelope as it is, and I'm going to see what my stream condition is. But what I can also do, I can add this hydrate curve and I can resolve it again. And ha let's have a look at plots once it finishes. You can see this nice purple or pink, depending on how you see colors, <laughs> um, curve. And it's clearly showing you that you are operating below the hydrate curve. So that's how you can investigate what are the temperatures. We are getting a question, what kind of margin of temperature should I use? So I would always recommend to keep your stream or your operating temperature at least five degrees above the solids formation temperature. And actually that's also the threshold Promax will use for the warnings. But how do we achieve that? We have to cool our stream to minus degrees Celsius. That's just what we have to do for the process. Uh, so we are going to inject methanol. Uh, first thing, when we want to simulate methanol, uh, we are going to go to our active environment and we're going to make sure that we actually use an environment or property package which is suitable for modeling methanol. For now, I'm using SRK as a, my, my property package, but I want to know if that's still suitable for simulating methanol. Uh, so if I need some help, I can always right click and I can select this, what's this? And I'm going to get kind of a short summary of what is suitable. And if you have a quick look through this list, uh, you will find this point where it says gas processing with methanol. So that's what we're going to do. And you are told that you should use the polar version of the package. And that's very important. Anytime you're going to be simulating methanol uh, injection, make sure to use the polar version of the package. So methanol is highly polar molecule. This package will make sure that it's correctly modeled. That's one thing to make sure. And then another thing, uh, we obviously have to have methanol in our component list. So I'm just going to find methanol and add it over here and click OK. I'm going to take a new stream and connect it to this node. And this is going to be my methanol injection stream. For temperature and pressure, I'm just going to give it the same temperature and pressure as we have in our uh, gas stream. This is actually Borchi. Um, and initially, I'm just going to say, let's see what happens when I inject one kilogram per hour. And let's have a look at composition. Uh, this is obviously going to be methanol. And let's hit OK. So let's solve this and see what happens when we injected uh, just one kilogram per hour. We look at this stream and we look at the freeze analysis. We can see that one kilogram per hour didn't really help as much. See the solids formation temperature is still pretty high. So let's try, uh, let's try five kilograms per hour. And let's have a look. I mean, it went down, but still not really significant. So obviously we need to use a higher amount of methanol. But what I wanna show you is that you do not have to do this try and error manually. Uh, I wanna show you one of the features we are one of the tools we have in Promax and that's our scenario tool. So I have embedded an Excel file using this add Excel workbook. And I have, a, I have prepared a table here, uh, which will show me how does the solids formation temperature changes with different methanol flow rates. Okay, so this is just an Excel table. 
Now what I need to do, I need to link these numbers to my Promax simulation. So if I go to Promax and I go to Scenario Tool, I can create a scenario tool. I'm going to do this very quickly, uh, but after I prepare this, I'm going to show you where you can find some nice tutorials on how to build the scenario tool step by step. So first thing, uh, let's give it a name. So this will be my methanol injection scenario. And let's add the variables. So I'm going to add a first variable, input variable, which is going to be my methanol flow rate. Moniker is the address of the object in Promax. Uh, and I can click the select Promax object, which will help me find out where it was defined. I know that methanol flow rate is defined in this stream three. And if I kind of go and search through this, I should be able to find the mass flow itself. So we go to properties. And if you scroll down, you see there is mass flow written in bold. So I'll choose that. That brings me back to my scenario tool dialog. And then I just hover over the cells I want to choose. You see the cell address updates. I'll check the units and I'll hit OK. Very easy um, once you get your hands on that. Let's do the same for the output. So what I'm going to be outputting from Promax is going to be the solids formation temperature. I'm going to select the object. Now I know it was defined over here in the analysis on stream two. I can see analysis here and I know it's in the freeze one, um, it's in properties, and then it's the solids formation temperature. That's what I want to use. Again, I check the units and I make sure that my cell address is correct. I could again hover over these cells or I could just use this arrows to move the whole array to the right. And I hit OK. Very easy. I can see here it says run from 1 to 10. That's what I want to do. And once I'm happy with this, I just click run. And what it will do, it's going to take the 10 kilograms per hour, input it in my simulation, run it, and then give me the answer here. Let me show you where you can find some very useful tutorials on how to build your own scenario tool. If you go to our website, we do have these tutorials here. If you look at Excel capabilities, uh, there is this video called Scenario Tool Basics. So if you want a kind of a step-by-step -step guide on how to build your scenario tool, make sure to check this. It looks like my scenario tool runs finished. And if I look at the results, and I'm telling you that I'm operating the stream at minus 10 degrees Celsius. How much methanol would you inject to make sure that you are always going to operate without any danger of hydrate formation? Uh, if you look at 30, when you inject 30, your solids formation temperature, you will start to form solids at two degrees Celsius while you need to cool it down to minus 10. So that's still not enough. 40 is still not enough. 50 is already good. 50 is good, right? Because the solids formation temperature is minus 17. Uh, we are operating at minus 10. It gives us seven degrees buffer. Uh, so I would, I would say 50 is a safe operation. We could go a little bit below 50. Um, you know, you could just try it run with slightly different numbers here. You could try what happens with 45, 46, and so on to find out the best injection rate. But make sure to keep there um, some margin. So that's how to simulate methanol injections. So really, the most important thing, make sure you use polar 
package. Make sure you include methanol uh, and then use the scenario to capabilities to help you find out what's the best injection rate. So Ali is asking why not 40? So let, have a look that if you inject 40 kilograms per hour, your solids, your uh, hydrates will start to form at minus six degrees, but you're operating at minus 10, all right? So still uh, not enough. Uh, let's continue in the presentation and we are going to talk about the TEG dehydration. So in the dehydration unit, we want to remove water using physical absorption. The solvent we are going to use is going to be TEG, so thriving glycol. The absorption is going to occur in this absorber column. And the rich glycol is then sent to this regenerator uh, section where we regenerate the glycol and we send the lean glycol back to the absorption. We are going to discuss some of the key performance indicators at this moment before we move on to the simulation part. So first, Thing you will usually see in dehydration units is that the wet gas is cooled down and any excess water which is formed is knocked down in the knockout drum. The rest of the gas with still some water in it is sent to the absorber. It is contacted there with uh, the TEG. The TEG is also cooled down before entering the absorber. And this is because the physical absorption, which is happening in the absorber, is actually preferred at low temperatures. Okay, so low temperature favors the physical absorption. If we think about pressures, uh, pressure wise, we'd like to operate the absorber at high pressure. Uh, usually you just use the pressure at which you have um, gas available because high pressure also favors the physical absorption. The absorber itself uh, can be trayed or packed. You can, um, you can see both in the industry and you can obviously model both in, in Promax. Uh, usually, the absorber would, however, equal to something around three to four ideal stages. The glycol flow rate has to be set such as the water is absorbed, right? Because that's our main, that's our main goal. Uh, there is a nice rule of thumb you can remember, and that is that uh, you'd like to circulate something between 15 to 40 liters of TEG per kilogram of water in the wet gas. This rule of thumb will usually make sure that you absorb a good amount of water. But you don't want to go too high on the ratio. You don't want to go to like hundreds liters of uh, TEG per kilogram of water. Because one interesting thing is that TEG will actually also absorb some hydrocarbons and especially the BTEX molecules, so benzene, toluene, etc. So if we over circulate our TEG, it will result in um, higher BTEX emissions, obviously. We will have some TEG losses uh, throughout the process. So we need to make sure that we are making up TEG to keep the flow rate. Usually what you use as the makeup stream will be really TEG at its highest purity. Uh, you don't generally buy 100% TEG. 
Usually the highest purity of TEG you can see is around 99.9 weight percent of TEG. After the water is absorbed to the glycol, the rich glycol goes to a three-phase separator where we obviously drop the pressure from the high pressure and we get, we generate some flash gas and potentially we can also skim there some of the hydrocarbon liquids which could form. The flashed glycol then goes through a heat exchanger uh, where we increase the temperature before it actually enters the regenerator section. In dehydration units, since this is a physical absorption, most of the desorption actually occurs in the reboiler. So that's why we kind of made this picture to be representative. We made the reboiler the biggest piece of equipment in the regenerator section. The regenerator column itself is usually just a small column at the top of the reboiler. And the regenerator section itself, it operates at low pressure because now we are in the opposite direction as in the absorption. So in the absorption, we wanted to operate at high pressure. When we want, when we want to desorb the water, we need to drop the pressure down. You can see that in this drawing, we're actually drawing a condenser over here. But in reality, there is actually no condenser vessel there. What is there is there is a coil wrapped around the top of the regenerator. And in that coil, we are, um, we are sending through that coil a cold medium. Usually what the cold medium would be, it would be the rich glycol coming from the absorption. So that's why you see that this rich glycol reflex coil is connected through the energy streams to the condenser. Why do we have the coil there? Uh, it's really just to minimize glycol losses. So we get some small reflux ratio at the top of the regenerator. The reboiler itself, it operates at around 204, 205 degrees Celsius. Obviously, we can operate as high as possible, but we cannot go higher uh, because we could degrade the TEG. So we need to make sure we are below the degradation point. So why, why do we actually do this process, right? We need to achieve some specifications on our product. Now, the specification on the water amount in the dry sales gas uh, differs. Um, it depends on where you're located, what kind of temperatures are common in your region, uh, what kind of processes are you going to be using this for. So while we say here that typically the pipeline specification is 0.12 gram per cubic meter, uh, you might have different specifications. It is pretty common that especially if you have very low specifications on your dry sales gas, that you are not able to achieve, um, achieve them just using the simple setup we have just described. So the simple setup would include all these kind of blue, blue lines. Sometimes what you will need to use, you will need to add some additional stripping in your regenerator section to allow you to achieve leaner glycol to regenerate better. The stripping medium, which is commonly, which are commonly used, uh, can either be some steam or dry gas from somewhere else, um, but that can, that is obviously associated with high operational costs. It can also be stripping BTAX. So what you would do is you would take your overhead stream and you would use a BTEX condenser to get a hydrocarbon liquid, and you would use that hydrocarbon liquid for uh, the stripping. Third.
third option is to use part of your product, part of your dry sales gas as the as a stripping gas. So those are the three options on where do we get the stripping medium. And then there are two main options on how do we use them to actually enhance the regeneration. So we can either directly inject the stripping medium to our regenerator section, to our boiler, or, and that's more common, uh, is we use another column, which is so-called stall column, and that will further improve the stripping because we are having more stages available for that. So at that at this moment, I'm again going to go to Promax. I'm going to pull up uh, this Promax file. And at this point, this is really just showing a general uh, simple TEG dehydration unit with the glycol contactor and the glycol regenerator. As always, first thing we should check is our environment. So if I go to active environment, uh, we can see what is our package we would use. Uh, we are using Peng Robinson. If you didn't believe me that this is the best package to use, uh, and SRK would be valid as well. You can again use the what's this trick, or you can have a look in our help. Uh, you can access help if you just hit F1, wherever you are, and it should open a help page, which is relevant to what you're looking at. So it opened a help page using a predefined package. And let me have a look at this page, for example. I would scroll down and have a look at uh, where do I see dehydration process? And I can see it here. And I would see here that I'm suggested to use SRK or Peng Robinson. So I'll keep Peng Robinson. If I go to components, uh, I obviously have my gas components. Don't forget to include TEG. And let's hit OK. You can see uh, by judging on the colors that some things have been already specified in this model. So we are not going to be specifying everything from the scratch. Um, namely, our wet gas was already defined, our knockout drum was already defined. I have already inputted uh, a guess in my recycle outlet stream. If you're not familiar with recycle blocks, uh, recycle block helps you to break the loops in the simulation, and you can provide an initial guess into the outlet stream of the recycle block. I have also already defined my uh, glycol contactor. So I'm modeling this glycol contactor using three stages, and these are really ideal stages as I'm using ideal stage model type. This is a physical absorption. We do not have any chemical reactions here. So our column type is really just the general ideal stage concept. Since we're using ideal stage model, we do not have to fill in any information about the hardware. Uh, we could if we wanted to calculate pressure drop hydraulics, but we don't have to. Um, the only thing we, I had to put in here was some pressure change throughout the column. All right, so that part is already specified. And we're going to go through the rest of the simulation and specify it together. Our rich glycol, as I said, is the cold medium which is going to be used in the reflux coil. This temperature of stream two, so after it leaves the coil, will actually depend on how do we operate the regenerator. So I don't necessarily know what this temperature is. Uh, what I know is that it's going to result from what I specify over here. 
So what I have to do to be able to solve this is I have to use this um, recycle block. And this is a cube recycle, which is used for recycling energy streams. Um, and what I do is I simply open this block. I go to process data. And as for all the recycle blocks, I gave it some initial guess. So I'm going to say that maybe this will be something about five kilowatts. Honestly, it does not matter what your guess is. It's going to iterate, but you have to give it some starting point. I also need to specify a pressure drop throughout the coil. So if I go to process data, I'm going to put some small pressure drop over here. And that allows me to solve the reflux coil heat exchanger. My rich flush tank is going to be operated at 5.2 bar atmospheric or absolute, sorry. Uh, so I specify that. Further in the flash vessel, I'll assume I'm having zero pressure drop. That allows me to solve this. If you are good with colors and you're, you have a good screen, you should be able to see that while these two streams are green, the stream number four is kind of blackish or very dark gray. Uh, that color indicates that there is a zero flow. So anytime you see dark gray or black streams on your screen, it's a very easy indication that there is a zero flow in that stream. Uh, our lean rich glycol exchanger will help me to increase the temperature to around 150. I need to make sure that I specify pressure drops on both sides. I have done that before already. And we're moving to our regenerator section. So let's open the glycol regenerator itself. We are going to again use the idle stage model with four idle stages. So you can see the selection here. You see that we do have some column add-ons. So there is a partial condenser and a reboiler communicating with uh, the regenerator column. I need to specify again the operating pressure and the pressure change. So we said that regenerator is going to operate at low pressures to help us with the stripping. So we actually operate at atmospheric pressure. And then we have to make two specifications. How do I know that two? I have a look into my specifications tab and I see that my degrees of freedom is equal to two. And that's because I do have the condenser here and I do have the boiler here. One of the specifications uh, we would commonly use for specifying these glycol units is some small reflux ratio. So usually a good number is around 0.1 for the reflux ratio. This is really just to simulate that this, there is going to be small reflux to prevent the Ichi losses. And I'll go, I'm going to make it a specification. You see my degrees of freedom went to one. And then what else do I have to specify? I should probably specify something around my reboiler. Uh, it could be the reporter duty or something else. And I would actually suggest you here to specify the reboiler operating temperature. So if I go, if I open either stream 10 or stream lean TEG, I would just specify here that I want to make sure that I operate this at around 204. Uh, this will make sure it's at the highest temperature possible. But at the same time, it's still operating below the TEG degradation temperature, which is around 207. You see that that makes all the streams around this part kind of brown. So that 
makes um, them to be able to solve. And we're getting to this upper part. If you have never seen this block, make sure you pay attention and make sure you fall in love with it because I, I seriously do. <laughs> it's a very useful block um, for all the solvent processes like dehydration unit is or if you have amine sweetening unit because it will make sure that it will add the right amount of the solvent to keep the circulation at steady state. And it will do that calculation for you automatically. You just have to give it some specifications. One specification to give is to say, what is the makeup composition available? So if you go to the makeup stream, you notice that I already specified temperature and pressure at which I have it available. And then if I go to composition, I can specify here, what is the purity of TEG I have? And I told you that um, the maximum purity you usually can see is around 99 uh, weight percent, uh, and the rest would be a small amount of water. And let's hit OK. I do not specify what is the flow rate of the makeup stream. That's something Promax will calculate for me if I tell it what is my desired circulation rate. So after the makeup block, in this case, for example, stream 12, I'm going to say how much I would like to circulate. Okay, and how do I know that? Uh, remember, I told you there is this nice rule of thumb uh, to circulate between 15 to 40 liters of TEG per kilogram of water in the feet. So let's have a look at how much water I actually have in the feed to the system. So if I go to composition and mass flow, I can see I have around 106 kilograms per hour of water. So I do have 106 kilograms of water and it should be between 15 to 40 liters of TG per that. Uh, let's go with the ratio of 20. So now I know that I should circulate 2,120 liters of TEG. So over here on the standard liquid volumetric flow, I would do 200, uh, 2,120. And then I really like this feature where you can type your units directly after the number and hit enter. And that gives me uh, the flow rate. Then uh, pump is already defined. So for pump, we do have the overall efficiency and we do have our uh, outlet pressure because we need to, again, get it to high pressure. And, and that's it. So once you're happy with all your specifications, uh, let's hit execute flow sheet. And it's going to iterate through the recycle blocks we do have in our simulation. We do have a question in the chat, which says, what efficiency is used for the contactor and regenerator? So for the contactor, I said we are using three ideal stages. Um, usually when you have um, trace, trace would be around 25 to 35 percent efficient. So you can imagine that you might have around 12 real trace in the contactor. And for the regenerator, uh, the efficiency there uh, usually would be even higher. So you might have around 50 percent 
efficiency. But the regenerator, as it's usually a very small section at the top of the reboiler, oftentimes uh, those would be packed. So it looks like everything converged. What I like to do, I always like to look at warnings. And I really love when I don't see any warnings here. So that's good. <laughs> and then we would definitely look at the results, right? Because that's what we're actually interested in. So what, are, what is our main interest? Our main interest is to make sure that our dry gas is in spec. So let's open the dry gas stream. And let's look at its composition. Here we can see how much water we have there. Uh, to be honest, normally the specification is not given in mole percent. Usually it's given in water content, uh, which would be like grams of water per cubic meter, etc. So to get that number, we can use analysis again. And if we do use this freeze out analysis and hit OK and solve it, we'll be able to see what is our water content. We'll be able to see what is our solids formation temperature, which is uh, very important, right? If we want to prevent hydrates from forming. That's what we can see using this analysis on the dry gas. Just out of um, curiosity, let's have a look at the same analysis on the wet gas, all right? So on the wet gas stream, let's do the same analysis. And let's see, you see here, we would form solids already at 17 degrees Celsius. While later on, if we remove the water, we were able to get to minus two. So that's a pretty good, pretty good improvement. And the same goes obviously for the water content because that's relevant, right? One thing I mentioned in the beginning when we were going through the KPIs of this uh, process is that unfortunately, TEG also absorbs some of the hydrocarbons and especially the BTEX molecules. And if you imagine what is the root of the BTEX? Um, it would be, it will get absorbed here, and then some of it might get flushed over here, and some of it might get flushed here in the water gas. So what we will see is we will see some BTEX emissions in these streams, and BTEX emissions are monitored and they are checked by authorities. So it, it is something that you definitely want to pay attention to when you're simulating your um, TEG unit. When we look at the contactor itself and we have a look at the results, we can see these recoveries. And this is where you can really clearly see that it's really the BTEX molecules which are getting absorbed. So this is the rich glycol stream. You see that heptane itself, it's not really getting absorbed, but benzene is. So that's where you can see the recoveries. And finally, you wanna make sure that you know how to find the emissions. So let's have a look at the water gas stream. If I ask you, how do I find, how do you find emissions? Tell me what are, how many tons per year do we um, have uh, of the emissions of BTEX? Uh, you might go just to composition, right? Go to mass flow, have a look at these numbers, change the units and do the sum somewhere in your head if you're really good with doing calculations by your head or um, in the calculator, but what you can also use is one of our analysis, and that's the composition subset analysis. So that's an analysis which will do the sum for you. So if I hit OK, 
I am able to choose some component subset. And there is one which is called BTEX only. If I choose it, it's going to directly select the appropriate components. And if I hit solve, I can have a look at results and I can have a look at the sum. Um, let's change these units to ton per year. And I can easily see that with the way I have designed my unit, I'm going to be uh, having emissions of 37 tons per year of BTEX. And then you, of course, have to check that with your local authorities if that's okay or, or not. Other way how to get these emissions is one thing I wanted to show you. If you're not familiar with, um, make sure to have a look at our Promax property census group. That group is a group which uh, includes a lot of additional functionalities. Most of these were added based on our client's request. So they came to us and they were like, hey, I would like to do a certain thing. Uh, and then uh, we developed these stencils for them. So this is kind of an invitation for you as well. If you ever missed anything in Promax, um, some functionality, some you know easy trick, or just visualizing something, let us know and we'll be happy to have a look at how that could be possible. There is a stencil which is called some components. So that's this one. And if I bring it up to the flow sheet, it will ask you to select some process stream. So let me select this water gas stream. Hit OK. It's going to ask me what units I want to look at. I want to look at mass bases. It's going to ask me for the units. Um, T-O-N is the British ton. Uh, T-O-N-E is the metric ton, right? If you haven't uh, known yet. Let's hit OK. And now I select a group. And again, there is already a group called BTEX. You see, we do have groups like greenhouse gases, uh, VOCs, and so on. Uh, so that can help you for other emissions. But let's do BTEX and let's hit OK. And it's directly giving me a message on my flow sheet about what the BTEX emissions for the water gas stream is. So very nice to very nice to see uh, this way. So this is how you simulate a simple dehydration unit. If you wanted to have a look at some more higher level designs or use of the stripping medium, stall column, etc., I strongly recommend you to go to our example projects. So if you go to open example project. It will open a file directory. And here you can you have access to all the example files. So whenever you have Promax installed, you guys have access to this. All right. And then in the midstream folder, there is a dehydration folder. And that's where you can find example files for all different setups. So there is a setup where we use mass and heat transfer model to, to model the columns. There is a setup where we also simulate the stall column and other, other options. So if I just quickly open this dehydration unit with stall column, you will be able to look at how would we go about adding stall column and stripping gas into the simulation. So I strongly recommend you anytime you will start with the dehydration simulation, make sure to check out the example files. Uh, have a look at those. Um, definitely let us know. I mean, we'll be happy to help you get started. Uh, but I, I feel like uh, having a look at the example files is always is always a good idea.
Apart from that, uh, don't forget we do have the tutorials available. And if you choose that you want to have a look at tutorials which have something to do with dehydration, you'll see here we do have very nice videos. We do have uh, videos how to calculate glycolysis, how you can use the analysis we already did in this webinar, how you simulate packed columns, and etc. Um, very nice webinar, which was conducted by our colleagues in US, is on this glycol dehydration emission tool, which is a tool which can really uh, help you simplify your uh, reporting of uh, glycol uh, dehydration emissions. So make sure to make sure to check uh, check those. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me for today's session where we discussed the inhibition and dehydration. So thank you everyone for joining. Have a great day. Bye.